Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for accelerated inner growth and empowerment. I'm Janneke, and if you're new to my channel, welcome here. I'd love for you to subscribe so you get new notifications of my interviews with amazing teachers and my own video blogs, and you do that below. Now, today you're in for a treat. You're going to meet Dr. Eben Alexander and Karen Newell. And Karen and Eben also have a profound masterclass in Wisdom from North membership called Bridging Science and Spirituality to Facilitate a Love-Filled Life, Lessons from a Near-Death Experience. You don't want to miss this and you can get all the info you need in the link below about the membership and this masterclass. Now over to my guest for today, Eben Alexander used to practice as a neurosurgeon for 25 years before he had a profound near-death experience in 2008. Today he is the author of Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. Now Karen is the co-founder of Sacred Acoustics. She's an innovator in the emerging field of brainwave audio meditations. We're going to learn more about that today and also dive into near-death experiences. So let's meet our guests. Hello, Eben. Welcome to you. Well, Janica, thank you so much for having me back on. It's great to be here. And hello, Karen. A warm welcome to you as well. Thank you, Janica. We're very excited about this project. I want to thank you for an amazing masterclass and I cannot wait for people to uh, experience it because we're going to experience a powerful meditation that you made Karen on also seeing how really science is supporting spirituality and also learn about your powerful uh, NDE uh, even and I, I'd love to start with you I have many questions for this conversation um, your NDE experience was really profound. You had it in 2008 and I've interviewed many people before who've had uh, near-death experiences and to me there are many similarities like many experience the tunnel uh, etc uh, but also there are differences. Some meet Jesus, some meet Buddha uh, and you sort of had a dark experience at the, at, uh, in the beginning and then a beautiful experience in these higher realms. So why, from your perspective, why do you think that those who have NDEs have different individual experiences? Well, I think the interesting thing is that the NDE seems to always be tailored to uh, best help the soul involved. Um, I mean, to me, that is kind of a strong rule. Of, you know, I've heard thousands of NDEs from people who have shared them with me. And of course, I've read about thousands on the internet and in other reports. So I'm familiar with a lot of these. But uh, the interesting thing is you can, you can kind of detect that uh, kind of undercurrent of ineffability of, of kind of the deep and rich spiritual power of that infinitely healing force of love. I mean, there are many hallmarks and the scientists like Dr. Bruce Grayson and Jan Holden who have investigated uh, these experiences for five decades or more uh, show this certain consistency. And in fact, Dr. Bruce Grayson uh, came up with a scale back in the 1980s, a 16 point scale that uh, measured uh, the various kind of uh, cognitive, affective uh, and transcendental uh, kind of levels of these experiences. So you can certainly define very kind of regular appearances of qualities and consistencies across these messages. And yet they are ultimately always there primarily to help the individual soul grow. Uh, I would say my own NDE probably has its biggest value uh, to the world in many ways because of the medical documentation of the damage to my brain when I was having the experience. And that's something that comes out in that uh, medical case report in the September 2018 Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease. Um, and, and that really brings some tremendous power to it. Uh, but there are many rich spiritual aspects of, of literally hundreds of other NDEs that to me make up this, in, this beautiful background of what the NDE territory is all about. 
And the fact that they're not all identical uh, to me is really a support of their authenticity. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is no matter what the medical situation like head, head injury or stroke or what have you, that sends somebody into an NDE. And then of course, you've got that whole category of shared death experiences. Shared death experiences are just like NDEs, but they happen in perfectly healthy people for the most part, like someone standing at the bedside of a lying, of a dying a loved one, or of uh, you might be a thousand miles away and, and your departing mother soul could still come through you on the way out and take your soul along. And when the bystander soul goes along, that's called a shared death experience. And uh, these are all extraordinary real aspects of human experience. And the more modern science studies them, the more we can come to a deeper and richer understanding of this. But I think now that it is truly part of, uh, you know, the NDEs and their corroboration and validation are part of the scientific body of study, that does a tremendous amount of good for this world because science offers some objective ways of comparing information in ways that we can share uh, and come up with expectations that go beyond our personal experience and personal memory of events. That's where the science of consciousness, especially with the tip of the spear of NDEs, provides such a rich tool to the world at large to awaken to this deeper truth of the primacy of consciousness. Yes, I remember you mentioned shared deaths in the masterclass, and I've never heard of that before. So I was particularly interested in that part as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious. Uh, uh, I remember I, I read your book many years ago, and I think I remember you said that when you were on the other side, you got access or answers to all questions. Um, how has it been coming back from being in this place and then integrating all that knowledge and wisdom and information and then being limited to the body where probably you're not able to um, sort of manifest as quickly, create, uh, all of a sudden you're in another world. I I'm wondering about that transition coming back. How was that like? coming back to this world, having all that knowledge? Well, it was very strange because remember that one of the unusual features of my NDE, uh, and in fact, this is probably the main factor that uh, kept me from getting a, a perfect score of 32 on, on Bruce Grayson's NDE scale, uh, was the fact that I was amnesic, that I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life. I had no words or language no knowledge of earth or this universe. I really started with an empty slate and that's really quite unusual for an NDE. And it took me months after my coma to even understand why I would have that unusual feature. But I think it had a lot to do with the profound lessons that I was to learn. And uh, in fact, if I had selected, you know, if I had scripted this myself, uh, it would have involved my father who had passed over four years before my coma, he would have been my guardian angel, and yet he was nowhere to be found. And that was a very deep mystery to me early on. Uh, but, you know, luckily through this wonderful process of meditation and using sacred acoustics to return to my uh, NDE daily, uh, I try to do that an hour or two a day and meditate. And often those meditations involve uh, recovering kind of relationships and integration of my uh, NDE experience. But it's through that uh, sacred acoustics work that I was able to connect with my father again about two and a half years after my coma experience. That's all a story that I tell in Living in a Mindful Universe, but it, that had a lot to do with kind of my fully coming to that deeper understanding of the reason my father was not there because I I would have been more tempted to dismiss the whole thing is you just see who you want to see on the way out. Uh, and yet he wasn't there. And uh, although it gets more complex than that, because in a fashion he was there, but not in a form I could recognize. Again, that's all explained in the book. But the reality is um, that this is all about our developing this uh, relationship with kind of our higher self and with that primordial mind. And I believe that's where a tremendous amount of energy comes to us in terms of manifesting our free will for the highest and best good. And one thing that's very reassuring is how much support I've gotten from the scientific community 
uh, who uh, is very supporting of my effort, my work, and I participate with a lot of scientists around the world in various email groups concerned with uh, understanding consciousness and addressing the very question of survival of the soul after bodily death. And I would say that uh, from my point of view, the scientific community is really on the verge of a major 180 degree flip uh, along these lines that comes fully into supporting the reality, not only of afterlife experiences, but also of reincarnation because our minds are much bigger than can be put into the small little theater of just birth to death in this body and in one incarnation. And that is the great gift that this awakening will bring to humanity. Yes, that makes me very hopeful. Uh, and over to you, Karen, you're working with sacred acoustics and uh, brainwave audio meditation. That was new to me. And I, I did that powerful meditation you made for the masterclass. And I noticed how something happened with my body. And I haven't, I meditated a lot, but I haven't done that before. And I felt somehow it went deeper. So, and apparently I understand that we can uh, cultivate a, a deeper connection to the divine through sacred acoustics. So I'd love for you to share a little bit about your work. All right, well, thank you so much. Yes, these meditations can really help the beginner meditator learn how to quiet that mind, but you bring something up very interesting. People who already have a practice of meditation very often find that these kinds of recordings help them to go deeper. And this is, you know, you mentioned feeling it in your body. So often we're just trying to quiet the mind and all of those racing thoughts are going on and, and, you know, we want to forget about the body, but sometimes our body can give us these kind of clues through the way the body responds. And so sometimes when you're getting into that very profound state, you might feel vibrations or tingling. You might feel a little bit of uh, pain, not, not severe pain, but you may feel a little bit of pain or discomfort in some part of your body. All of this is really pointing to an activation of your energy body, the part of you that cannot be seen. And so once you're able to get into these deeper states, all kinds of different effects can happen, uh, not just physical effects, but very often people, again, will have a quieting of the mind, but then things like symbols might appear. When your language kind of fades into the background, you might start to see doorways or faces or things like that. And these can all mean something to whoever is having that experience. So this is why we very often recommend keeping a journal of these kinds of experiences so you can track over time what might be going on. And each of us is going to interpret those experiences a little differently. So this really is, as Eben said, every near-death experience is tailored to the individual. So is a meditative journey. We call these sound journeys, uh, and it, it is a form of meditation, but we really do have the opportunity to move beyond the here and now. And that's when we start to have the opportunity to have some more spiritual types of effects. So when we're very relaxed and we set our intention, as we discuss in the class, you can attract certain information to you, for example, by posing a certain question, or if you do want to <clears throat> connect with a departed loved one, imagine what it feels like to be with that person. So really these audio recordings are designed to get your brain out of the way. That's how Eben describes his experience sometimes that the meningitis shut down that neocortex, the thinking part of the brain. And so again, it's not as extreme, but these recordings can have a similar but more subtle effect to kind of move that thinking brain out of the way. And the way we do this with these binaural beats is we deliver one frequency to one ear and then a slightly different frequency to the other ear. And it's the difference between those two frequencies that creates this sort of wah, wah, wah sound. And every time you hear a sound like that, it's designed to affect a different part of your, not a different part of your brain, it's designed to affect a different brainwave state. And so there's all kinds of uh, harmonic layers going on in the background of these recordings and they work together to help you achieve a lot of the effects that I've just explained. But this is something that really can't be explained. It must be experienced. And so the recording we include with the class gives you that opportunity and it can be listened to every day because every time you listen, 
you can have a different effect. The, the regular listening routine will lead to cumulative effects over time. And so the first listening may be very profound and it may not be very profound, but either way, we encourage you to keep listening. And if this sort of uh, technique doesn't work, there's so many other techniques out there that we can all take advantage of to really learn our particular method for getting into these expanded states of awareness. I think it's very inspiring that uh, you're teaching us that it is possible for us to be able to uh, have these states of consciousness because sometimes we can, I think a lot of people can feel like, why didn't I have a near-death experience? It seems so amazing. I, I want to feel this unconditional love uh, but actually through practice, we can come closer to this state of being. And you also mentioned gratitude, cultivating gratitude, that that's important. And I, I noticed cultivating gratitude. So is that not just, you know, something we can, I, I can be grateful right now. It, it's actually something we need to cultivate. Well, I would, I would put it this way, is that it's very easy to think of things we're grateful for. We have the thought that we're grateful for our meal. We have the thought that we're grateful for our family, whatever it may be. But do you, can you generate that feeling of gratitude at will? Can you feel that warm feeling in your heart? And this is something that I learned through the HeartMath Institute, who teaches a particular form of uh, uh, coherence between the heart and the brain. And at the basics, it really is generating a feeling of gratitude. So when I first started doing this, I could think up here of many things I was grateful for, but that feeling of gratitude was elusive and it did take some practice. And for me, I, the advice was to think back to another event in your life that caused you to have this feeling of joy or happiness or gratefulness, whatever it may be, anything that brings you that warm feeling. And so I saw it way back in my life and eventually landed on this event that happened when I was six or seven years old, when my mother took in a stray dog that became part of our family. And within a matter of weeks, she had given birth to puppies underneath my bed. Now I had two brothers and I thought this was very special that she chose my bed and not their bed. And I was the only one that she would allow to touch the puppies. And this, this to me was just a magical moment. And so having that memory, I practiced having this memory over and over again and all the dogs I'd had through my life who brought me this kind of joy. Not everyone's gonna respond to dogs the same way, but that's how I did. And so over time I developed this and I could generate that feeling at will. And when you're able to do that, this really points to the idea that that love is generated from within each and every one of us. But very often we can't get to that feeling because we've put say old uh, emotional traumas that we haven't really processed properly. We kind of just put them away and they, they're still in our system. So sometimes when you go to feel that gratitude, that's what's in your way. And that you might have to kind of crack through that a little bit. And our sacred acoustics recordings, sometimes when people listen, they'll have an emotional response and they won't understand why. And to me, I explain that as that you're activating something that's already in your system that you may not be aware of. Just like you might have those physical effects, those emotional effects are speaking to just something activated that's already in your system. And so that's an opportunity to release that emotional trauma. You don't have to put a story to it or know exactly what it is, just know that it's leaving. And as those kinds of things leave you uh, little by little over time, you're much more able to really find and grow that gratitude from within. And as we do this, heart math teaches that this feeling radiates to all those around us. And so I kind of liken this to the ultimate golden rule where generating feelings within us actually affects people around us without us even having to say a word. And if everyone in the world would learn how to do this, cultivate that gratitude, knowing that it radiates out to the world, this will help our world become a better place. Yeah, 
Beautiful. I'm going to jump a little bit and go back to you, Eben, and ask a question I think many people are wondering about when it comes to death. I mean, we're going through really challenging times. I think we're going through a huge transformation with COVID-19. People are passing away. And I think uh, death is on our minds. And I actually uh, feel that in our culture, we're a bit afraid of speaking about death. So to me, I've always been very curious about it, but I've been wondering about is, uh, because you went to the other side and you, you received a lot of uh, answers. Do you believe that there is a certain date and it's predestined when we're going to pass over to the other side? Because I know that you heard that you needed to go back so, or, or can we, are we co-creators who actually choose with our higher selves when to pass over? Well, I believe that in many ways we're co-creators that uh, with our higher soul being very much involved in that. Um, but I also, I also believe that um, in many ways, I think that our lifetime can be looked at a kind of a dance between um, our higher soul and soul group planning certain hardships because I came back from my coma realizing that the hardships and difficulties in life, certainly as a physician that would involve il illness and injury, um, are actually part of a plan. So those are kind of like stepping stones and it's how we uh, adapt to those hardships, to those challenges in life, whether we're able to recover love of the universe for ourselves whether we're able to continue through those difficult and challenging situations, manifesting love for others and showing kind of the highest and greatest good for all. I think that's what this is, is this beautiful dance where the free will aspect is our response to the hardship and the difficulty. And so I believe it is all really about growth. Uh, and in many ways, it's important to stress, and this is something Karen uh, has, has mentioned before, but... Uh, uh, the fact that uh, this is really where our souls get the work done is in these lives, facing these hardships, but also knowing, knowingly kind of uh, disconnected from our memories of our higher soul. Uh, you know, those memories of past lives and between lives. And I think in many ways that uh, program forgetting uh, gives us skin in the game and allows us to really jump in uh, and really uh, be engaged in these lives we're living. Uh, because I don't believe we get much of that growth actually done in the spiritual realm. That's where we have life reviews, where we go back through it all with our uh, soul group and then plan next incarnations. But in terms of actually uh, growing as souls, I believe most of that work is actually accomplished here in these bodies, living these lives. And so that is a point that Karen made earlier about the important part of NDEs is not what do I expect to happen when I die, but far more important is what does the reality of NDEs and my knowing of that kind of life review and reuniting with souls of departed loved ones and planning next incarnations, what does that imply about how I should live this life? And that's where I think uh, this, uh, you know, the scientific uh, uh, study of consciousness that's emerging to show us the power of this primordial mind is so important. But of course, uh, your listeners don't have to wait for the scientific community to get fully on board with the notions of primordial mind. They can do it themselves through meditation, centering prayer, these modes of going within and exploring consciousness provide tremendous power for us to thus use that kind of um, cultivation of our relationship with our higher soul in engendering the, the loftiest world of our dreams. Would you say, or do you believe that there are any accidents or is everything in divine order even though we have chaos there is order in chaos like especially what we're seeing right now is there a meaning behind it like a perfectly orchestrated um e event that or situation we're experiencing right now well, I believe that there's a tremendous amount of purpose to, to all events. I, and, and personally, I don't think there are any accidents. I don't know if I can prove that, but I do believe, uh, I know that I've come to look much more deeply at the events in my life uh, and to be much more aware of synchronicities. 
Uh, Carl Jung made a, a, a big deal of synchronicities of those coincidences that really go beyond any kind of causal explanation in our material world and yet seem to link us much more deeply with meaning uh, at the core of events in this universe. And I believe being aware of synchronicities in my life uh, has been a tremendous gift to show me this kind of higher ordering. Uh, and I believe that's a lot of where the world is going, is coming to recognize that all those hardships and challenges and difficulties in many ways, if properly viewed from a proper perspective, especially given this kind of spiritual enlightenment, that they really can engender a much richer and deeper understanding of our nature, of our purpose for being, and of our abilities to influence this universe for the better. Uh, so I believe that that awareness of the primacy of mind uh, and the power that it has, that primordial mind has to uh, determine the events in this world, the more we realize that our free will as a higher soul can align with that, the more we're relieved of kind of the, the auto automatonic behavior that some attribute the ego mind to and the linguistic brain and kind of materialist science says that that form of lowly form of consciousness uh, is uh, just an automaton. It has no free will whatsoever. That's what conventional science would try and tell you because it believes that your consciousness is an epiphenomenon, uh, an illusion of the chemical reactions and electron fluxes in the physical substance of my brain. And yet what we're really coming to realize at a much deeper level is given that the brain is not producing consciousness, but only serving as a, a, a filter that allows primordial consciousness in, then we don't have to be uh, misled by that kind of materialist scientific assumption that we have no free will whatsoever. Uh, in fact, I believe the whole universe exists for sentient beings to manifest their free will. And that is what drives this evolution. And what, and what we see is the destiny of humanity uh, is an example of the free will of that primordial mind writ large as it's expressed through the sentient beings known as homo sapiens. Interesting. And a question I've been thinking about all day is that um, when you went to these other realms, there were very different realms. And I, maybe someone out there is a bit afraid actually of dying uh, because there are these beautiful uh, stories about it and also not so beautiful stories, although they are more rare. Uh, and when we dream, we go into what I believe is the astral world. And sometimes I have nightmares and it's not so pleasant. And other times I have great dreams. I'm wondering about the different realms. Is there something to be a bit afraid of? Is there something we should think about? Uh, is it very, very important to forgive ourselves and forgive other people before we die? Um, or will we all eventually come into the light, even though we might feel, maybe have a more difficult transition in the beginning like you had? Well, I think that um, uh, there's no surprise to me that you encounter some apparent uh, darkness, some, um, you know, some realms that are not all the pink clouds and, and puffy sense of love. That was my earthworm's eye view. If I had just got, that was the first place I went in my journey. And if I just had that earthworm's eye view and then come back to this world, I would have had a hellish NDE, you know, a kind of a negative NDE. If you look at the big literature of NDEs in the world, hellish NDEs are probably somewhere less than 5% of the total. But it's important to point out that even the hellish NDEs, which might just involve a life review that's very unpleasant, uh, say in particular for someone who is busy handing out a lot of pain and suffering to others during their lifetime, then their life review, they have to feel all that coming back at them. Uh, and that certainly could give you a notion of kind of a hellish world. And yet, as we go more completely into the process, I believe we all enter those much loftier realms of, of kind of light and love, and especially coming in touch with that infinitely healing God force of pure love that's very apparent by the time people get to a life review. Um, and, and I think uh, from my point of view that, uh, uh, you know, there really is nothing to fear. Uh, this is all about love. And the more you come to realize that in the deepest aspects of NDEs, like in my core realm, it was clear to me that that uh, universal binding force of love ruled everything. There was not an opposing force of darkness. 
And so people often would ask me, would you believe that there's a hell or purgatory? And I, th I think there is absolutely no way I can make sense of an eternal damnation, given my experience, that there's no way that that infinitely loving God would ever consider uh, you know, a soul committed to uh, hell for, for eternity. But having a, a negative life review is part of having lived a, a life where you didn't necessarily love and show compassion and kindness. And it just serves as a course correction. Karen and I often like to say, uh, given the, the prominence of, of life reviews, they occur in more than 50% of near-death experience stories and have for the last 2,400 plus years, uh, it's, it's like the, the golden rule is written into the very fabric of the universe. Because the life review is often experienced from the perspective of those around us their emotional truth in dealing with our actions and even our thoughts about them. That's why it's important to be very careful of what we think too, not just how we act. Uh, but all of it is about love and compassion and kindness. And with, especially as we leave our ego voice and our little, uh, that small version of ourself, the ego mind and the linguistic brain, as we leave that behind in meditation and develop this much richer sense of connection with our higher soul, that's where I believe we can truly uh, begin to harvest this kind of love for all involved. And of course, Karen taught me the beautiful role of the daily review. Uh, and I think that's a really critical concept, uh, especially in discussion about life review. Very interesting. Um, yeah, over to you, Karen, daily review. Can you share a little bit about what that is? Yes, absolutely. So you know, when we get to the end of our lives, as Eben said, apparently we relive every experience we had, but from the point of view of the other. And that's when we find out what did our actions, how did someone else respond? And so what if we did this before we died? And this is rather simple. You can do this in a contemplative moment is sort of not necessarily every day, but maybe at the end of a contentious event, maybe an argument or something find a quiet space, get into a contemplative state and kind of ask yourself, you know, how might that other person have responded? Try to find that larger perspective of what might be going on. And very often you might find, oh my gosh, it's when I said something that that person responded in that way, but they misunderstood what I really meant by that. And so the whole point of this is not to determine what other people may correct in their behavior, but how might you adjust your behavior the next time you're in a situation like this? Or is it necessary to make some sort of amends with a person that perhaps you miscommunicated with in some fashion? And so this really is a way to keep yourself accountable as you go through life and really clear up any of those misunderstandings as you go along. And this can hopefully prevent us from being in a situation where we really need to reckon with these things because we've already done so. And so that's what I mean by a daily review. And Eben can attest that I do this kind of regularly where maybe a couple of days after a discussion we've had, I'll, I'll say, oh my gosh, I was wrong when I said this and, and life goes on. And so this is just a beautiful way to kind of get in touch with that higher perspective, that broader perspective as we go along through life rather than waiting until the very end. Fascinating. Uh, and life review is also so fascinating to me because my mind cannot understand how is it possible to have a life review that goes through every experience you've had from every perspective from other people. And there's so many times we do things, we don't know how it affects other people. Uh, so <laughs> I'm curious about how that is going to be, uh, but it just to know about it, to know that that's actually something a lot of uh, us will go through or a lot of NDEs have had as an experience. It seems like that's going to happen. That, that really helps me to become more conscious of my actions. And I think it's all about becoming more conscious of our actions uh, in our everyday lives. And I wanted to ask you, Karen, what is your take on what's going on right now? Because I, I've just interviewed an astrologer who said things are not going to become any lighter or easier anytime soon. We're still going to experience this transformational uh, period or dark night of the soul. 
What is your take on this? What, what are we to learn? Right well, now? I kind of uh, really identify with what you just said with this astrology we're saying that we're going through this transformation, we're going through this dark night of the soul. And when you're in the middle of that, it can seem very futile, it can seem very hopeless, very meaningless. Why, why, why do we have to go through this? Why can't we all just be happy and healthy? And uh, the transformation is the key word there. Because very many of us, we don't transform when we're, you know, sitting on a yacht sipping champagne or whatever your favorite activity may be. Uh, we transform when we go through hardships, when we have challenges in our lives. And so we kind of liken this to a collective challenge or a collective opportunity for transformation when the entire world is going through a very similar thing and we're all responding to it in different ways. You can look at all the different countries, the way each country has chosen to respond and what the results are. But we can each also as individuals respond differently, no matter what's going on around us. And so while things can seem so futile, some of us are really struggling with really survival, finding food and shelter. And those are the things that the rest of us who have the ability to assist can really help those kinds of people. But many, many, many of us, we are okay financially and we have a family to support us. But when we're kind of isolated from our normal life, it really is an opportunity to take that time to go within, contemplate, am I really living my life purpose? Do I feel as if I'm contributing to society in a positive way? Are there any hurts in my past that are still affecting me to this day so that I respond to things in this really kind of anxious way that have nothing to do with what's going on now, but that maybe something happened earlier in my life. So each of us, when we take the opportunity to transform our own soul, we actually contribute to the transformation of all of humanity. Because if we're all connected in this fashion, each and every one of us is critically important for the whole to transform. And so it can take a little time to get all of us up to speed. And sometimes it takes bigger challenges than others to really get some of us to really see the reality of what's going on. And so it, this whole thing is an opportunity is how we look at it to go within, to reevaluate our lives, to really understand our contribution to society. And then watch and see as each of us begin to transform ourselves individually, watch and see how the outer world responds in kind because the external world is a reflection of our inner world. Astrologers will absolutely agree with that. And uh, as we, it's our free will in this kind of template of reality that helps to affect change as we go along. So we getting that larger perspective is really the key to know that there's not just a light at the end of a tunnel, but a transformation that's coming. And after we get through the transformation, which I am certain we will, then we can look back and much more easily see how all of these seemingly negative, non-beneficial things that were happening actually contributed to us learning very important lessons about how to take care of each other and acknowledge that we're part of one global humanity, no soul left behind. Beautiful. Uh, and I think it's so powerful to understand how powerful we are as creators, that we do have this free will, that it's not happening to us, that we are actually creating this together with sort of the, the creation. And speaking of that, I'd love to ask you, uh, Eben, uh, about Om and, and God or the big creator, because uh, you write that you had an experience with meeting this light. Um, would, it's difficult to ask, but okay. Uh, are we part of that light and God? Is that us? Uh, because that's what I've been wondering lately. Am I really God just like a part of the whole uh, or is sort of that divine, the divinity, separate from us? Well, I think uh, certainly from my experience, uh, and notably 
uh, in, in the Gateway Valley, which was my first uh, rich spiritual realm that I encountered, uh, there was that soft summer breeze that blew through me. And that was my first awareness, given my complete amnesia and empty slate for any kind of human knowledge. That soft breeze was my first awareness of the divine, of the comforting, loving force of that God force. And then I began to realize that that God force and that binding force of love connecting everything that I was seeing in those spiritual realms and down below in the material realm. And then when I ascended through the uh, portals that were provided uh, through those angelic choirs in the Gateway Valley, they, they led me up um, into that highest, loftiest sanctum sanctorum of the divine, the core realm. And there, uh, just this immense sense of the binding force of, of love, just like bathing in an ocean of, of God's love, which I think is the same uh, kind of force and experience that uh, you know, so many others have had and brought back to this world, not just indie ears, but prophets and mystics going back to time immemorial. All of our religious systems originated from such journeys, from such kind of... Uh, uh, events that allowed people to have their minds open to the broader aspects of our connection with the universe. And I think that was, uh, that was for me a tremendous gift. And yet, as I've said, the science of consciousness is coming down very strongly supporting this notion of one mind, that we're all truly connected through one consciousness. And Karen always reminds me, and her spiritual mentorship has been very valuable to me, in reminding me that that is truly a heart consciousness. It's a loving mind. You cannot separate out the feeling of that ocean of love and of, of being at home. It's like it's our true spiritual home with this kind of broader sense of we're all in this together. And I came back from it, you know, as much as people tend to believe that your prior religious beliefs, I grew up in a Methodist church in North Carolina, and that they shape the outcome of your NDE. That is not true, uh, because in fact, uh, I, I knew from my experience that oneness with the divine, that oneness with God, I came to see God as the very source of our conscious awareness. Uh, in many ways, it brings back that uh, kind of deep knowing of there not being an opposing force of darkness, evil. Darkness and evil are just the absence of light and love. And yes, in our human world, there's a lot of apparent darkness and evil, but never will they not succumb to our serving as points of light to bring as a conduit this light and love into the world because that love, that God love has infinite power to heal. And that's one of the things that energizes my own personal effort to share this um, message is because in many ways, I realize that by bringing that uh, infinite love, compassion and kindness, that feeling that we soak in as an NDE by showing that we can all achieve that. And Karen and I have proved that in our workshops. Uh, people from all different walks of life who have not necessarily had an NDE, but also come to know this uh, profound, infinitely healing force of love that we can all connect with deep in our own consciousness as we come to realize that we are simply a projection of that God mind of pure love. And uh, that is where I believe this revolution of the one mind and nature of consciousness can really change this world for the better. As all of us come to realize that our natural state of being is one where we express love, kindness, compassion, not just for self, but for all others. And that originates with the, very, with the notion that our very conscious awareness is one with God, with that loving force. Yeah, that resonates so much with me as, my, as well. It's like a, a knowing that I just know I'm part of God, uh, that I've never been separated. So that resonates. Um, do you believe that we all have a specific purpose in life? Uh, one purpose is, of course, to, to be a soul uh, or being a soul, experiencing being human. But do you think that uh, for my incarnation, your incarnation, Karen's incarnation, we have specific individual purposes? I would say to know thyself and know thyself when you realize that you're actually uh, just one facet of the consciousness of the universe really implies a deep knowledge of the entire universe and our relationship and calls for being in it. Um, and I know that uh, Karen has helped me tremendously in kind of evolving that 
uh, notion and going within. That's what a lot of her work with sacred acoustics has involved. So I would, I would credit Karen with a tremendous amount of my knowing to go within and of the techniques to go there and do that. And Karen, do you think we all have a specific purpose in life? Well, I like how you said, you know, our purpose is, you know, we're a soul, we come here to be human, of course, but each of us is, a, each of our souls is a unique aspect of the whole. And so by really knowing ourselves, tapping into who we are, that purpose naturally comes forth. And some of us, sometimes I know I, myself included, um, I wanted there to be a specific task that represented my purpose. And it's not so much the specific task, it is how you manage that task, how you bring your energy to that task. And so whether you know it's, it's one thing or another is less important as to, are you serving your soul in a way that's authentic? And when each of us kind of taps into that authenticity that is uniquely ours, that purpose comes forth. And so that's how I like to describe purpose rather than something, it is specific, but it's not necessarily easy to explain. I love that because I speak a lot about soul's purpose uh, and I have a lot of events about it and I loved your perspective on that. That was really profound. This has been a very rich conversation. Now I want to ask one more question because I know a lot of people are feeling fear. And uh, I remember Neil Donald Walsh talked about that uh, we have two main feelings. Uh, we have fear and love. Uh, so that points to that fear is, is big. Like we're all experiencing fear. And sometimes I think we, we act a lot through fear actually and not through love. Uh, and sometimes I think about all the, the, the darkness in the world or people struggling or suffering in the world that it's almost feels not, I feel guilty being happy. And I think looking at what's happening right now, we can very easily go into that fear. What if this happens? What if I lose people? What if I get sick? And I, I've interviewed Anita Moriani, who had a lot of fear before her near-death experience. And now she's talking about there's nothing to fear. But knowing there's nothing to fear or, or thinking that it's something else than actually feeling that I have nothing to fear. So do you have any tips on how we can actually deal with fear when it shows up really intensely? Well, I, I just believe that going within offers tremendous strength because fear is something that's really harbored in the ego, the ego mind, that little uh, sense of self that, that harbors between birth and death in a physical body. Uh, and I believe that we can start to gain a greater sense of agency and of uh, uh, really kind of the ability to modulate and control our emerging reality. The more we develop this facile relationship uh, with that primordial mind and come back seeing the win-win situation. Uh, Karen and I often say all is well. All is well is simply a reflection of your being able to take a sufficiently lofty perspective to look at the events in your life and realize that all of them serve a valuable lesson. The things that we fear largely uh, come out of that false thinking of separation that comes out of materialist science that says we're all separate beings, that you can only understand this by understanding the laws of separation and what involves engagement between those separate objects, as opposed to realizing that there's a much more harmonious uh, kind of uh, simple purpose of growth and of learning and of, of a transformation available to all of us as we leave that little ego mind behind and start to realize that we're connected to a much bigger universe. Uh, one in, that has a much bigger scale of operation over uh, greater swathes of time and space. And that is one where we can truly start to manifest uh, this kind of higher uh, uh, loving connection with the universe and that win-win situation, kind of that sense of all is well by further developing that perspective. And that's why to me, uh, meditating, centering prayer, doing this, these every day has been a tremendous uh, source to help me get rid of that notion of fear, which I think is kind of a false interpretation that's mainly generated by the ego mind and its defenses. Interesting. And I would just add that very often fear 
is when we're anticipating something that's going to happen in the future or potentially something that's already happened in the past. Most of us, as we go throughout our days, of course, some of us will be in a situation where fear of being run over by a car or something overcomes us, but this doesn't happen on a typical basis. Usually that fear is something that we've created in our own minds. And so, as Eben said, by establishing a practice of going within a regular practice, you start to gain that larger perspective. You start to see that certain events are there to assist. You start to really understand that, that certain events that happen that you might normally be afraid of are actually potential gifts to you. And so it really is developing that larger perspective. And you find that out by going within. You can't control anything but the inside of your own consciousness. And so that's where we all need to begin. How are we going to respond? How are we going to manage our feelings? How are we going to manage our thoughts? I specifically don't use the word control because I feel like it's really just managing, uh, you know, kind of having this understanding of a larger perspective and, and how might we change our attitudes to eliminate these types of fears. This isn't going to happen overnight for someone who is really living in that kind of fear on a daily basis, but just finding that way to relax and finding that connection to something greater very often can start in very small gradual ways to start to assist you in realizing there is something greater. There's a greater purpose and we're all a part of it. And uh, when we can start to feel that connection, that's when those fears really start to dissipate. Beautiful. Thank you so much for this uh, rich conversation and also for your work, for doing this uh, also together. Uh, it's really com complimentary how you work together. And it's also interesting to hear with you, uh, Eben, even though you had such a profound near-death experience, you're still practicing. I always you know, find that interesting because sometimes we feel like people who are awakened or have had these amazing experiences, it's just all fixed, you know, that, that there's not Nothing more to work on but it uh, through all my interviews I understand that there's always more like there's always more always more always more development and expansion and it's almost like the near-death experience was the beginning of Eben's yeah. true journey yeah it is very much like the beginning but uh, I've, I've been very heartened by the uh, support from the scientific community and I think that helps a lot of people that this is perfectly aligned with the science. There's this myth out there that, uh, you know, science defies the uh, near-death experience. Well, no, that's not true at all. In fact, modern science really supports the reality, not only of the NDE, but of the afterlife. And that's why, the, uh, I mean, of, of reincarnation. So that's why the scientific uh, development is so important. Many people on earth see the richness of that, but ultimately, any individual soul who is interested in this awakening, there's plenty of fuel for them to join this awakening now and uh, they have all the information they need. Beautiful, and it's so amazing to hear that, that that bridge is starting to become more solid and that we hear more about it and that people like you are speaking about it. So we know things are happening and things are changing. So thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you so much for your beautiful masterclass in Wisdom from North membership and for being here for this interview. All right, Janica, thank you so much for having us on. Blessings to you. Yes, thank you as well. And thank you for watching everybody. Much light from Norway and the US. Bye bye. Yeah.